Hello folks and welcome back to the Non-Diet Yogi podcast where we explore yoga, earth-based living and gentle nutrition through a non-diet lens. I'm your host Casey Conroy, non-diet dietitian and yoga teacher and this is episode 2, Juice, Cleanse, Detox, Yoga. So I've woken up pretty early this morning before 5am and snuck out with the intention to record this before the rest of my family wakes up, my kids and hubby. And I woke up in a really calm state of mind, looking out over the valley where we live. And then I have gone and done some last minute research just to be able to flesh out exactly what juice cleansing is. And I've jumped on only about three different websites that sell juice and cleanses and fasts as an adjunct to yoga in some form, whether as part of a retreat or a juice cleanse package that is marketed alongside um, yoga challenges in yoga studios or just as a product that's advertised in the yoga studio or in books written by yoga teachers and I can feel my heart racing now because it's just kicked up all of this residual frustration guys it's I'm no longer in this calm mood even though I'm really trying hard to sound like I am there is just so much misinformation out there surrounding juice cleanses, fasting, detoxification and it's all combined with diet culture when it overlaps with yoga. So (laughs) what is juice cleansing exactly? A juice cleanse is a usually anywhere from one to seven day period where a person embarks upon a fairly defined, let's just say, dietary regime where they are mainly, if not completely, subsisting off juices. Now, the juices could be purely vegetable juices. They could be fruit and vegetable juices. People will go on a juice cleanse for a number of reasons, but... The main reason people will do it, or I'll just list the juice cleanse benefits as um, listed by one extremely popular cleanse website. And so basically they have a, a list that includes feeling lighter and brighter, feeling refreshed and energized, feeling motivated and inspired, experiencing weight loss, losing stubborn kilos, Improved mental clarity and reduced brain fog, clear glowing skin and eyes, eliminated cravings and addictions, having reduced bloating and improved digestion, appreciating the many benefits of a body cleanse, and a natural desire for healthy lifestyle choices. So those last few don't quite make sense to me as a benefit of a juice cleanse, but okay. Um, And then there's a big list of other reported benefits, including improvements in chronic disease, improved immune system, reduction of chronic pain and depression, anti-aging, reduced cellulite, reduced allergies, improved digestive health and organ function, balancing hormones. So that's quite a laundry list. Um, (laughs) And what I'm hoping to do in this podcast is to really dissect and get a micro, um, a magnifying glass out and actually really look at these claims because juice cleansing is so popular in the yoga world and in my colleagues and clients as a nutritionist and yoga teacher I would say that even though people come to a juice cleanse with you know, the desire to get all these so-called health benefits. The most common one underneath it all is generally wanting to lose weight, even if it's just a kilo, a couple of kilos. There's almost always 
uh, just underneath the surface, a desire to lose just a little bit of weight. You know, there that's just um, one juice cleanse site. There's literally thousands of these out there. Um, just looking at the website of a very famous yoga retreat, uh, yoga center, actually, a really big one. Um, they've got um, detox fasting and cl- juice cleansing retreats held multiple times per year, lasting anywhere from three to seven days. And basically, um, these guys have a similar laundry list of benefits of cleansing, fasting and detoxing. Yeah, some pretty, some pretty hectic looking um, benefits are being claimed there. And this cleanse um, includes colon hydrotherapy, infrared sauna sessions, and of course, um, some yoga. So, one last little um, website I've looked at is uh, another very big yoga studio where they're selling books written by um, the owner of the studio this is this one in particular is a detox book and it kind of just broke my heart to read this where the description of the book includes um, this sentence this book has been designed to allow all of us to be the best version of ourselves and to let go of our strict diets and then about one or two sentences later Um, It says packed with a variety of healthy juices, smoothies and soup recipes to cleanse and purify the body. So you will be fully equipped to start fresh. (sighs) Those two sentences totally contradict each other, guys. Um, Letting go of strict diets is not the same as um, uh, subsisting off juices, smoothies and soups just to let you know okay (laughs) so that's that um really tricky bit where I just wanted to give you an idea of what's being marketed as a juice cleanse in the yoga world and what I want to explore today is why why is this so popular in yoga circles I'll also be exploring exactly what is actually going on in your body when you do a juice cleanse are you actually detoxifying yourself what are possibly some of the explanations for the benefits some people feel at a certain point in these diets and what are some gentler alternatives to doing this so first I'm going to dive really deep guys I'm just going to go there we're going to go right to the heart of why this is such a big thing in yoga circles. I'm going to start with this concept of tapas, which is one of the niyamas. Now, the the niyamas are the second limb of the eight limbs of yoga from um, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And the niyamas are a reference to um, duties that are directed towards us ourselves as individuals these are inner observances things that we want to cultivate in ourselves tapas is one of the niyamas and it basically translates to discipline now often when someone goes to see a doctor and they're stressed out or maybe even anxious the doctor you know very well meaning will often say hey you should try yoga There's this common belief, guys, that yoga is a physically therapeutic practice and that it helps you to connect to your body and it helps you to look after your physical and mental health. And whilst that can be true, it's not necessarily always true. And actually, historically, it wasn't very true at all. (laughs) Um, Part of the Hatha Yoga tradition involves austerity discipline this niyama of tapas and for some yogis this might mean practicing a certain posture or certain sequence of postures over and over again for months and if you go back far enough into the history of hatha yoga it actually got more extreme so it might be certain forms of bodily mortification and i'll talk about that a bit more soon but if you do look 
that far back enough into Hatha Yoga history, if you look into the texts and read those texts, there's actually not a lot to suggest that yoga is meant to help you to improve your performance, to make you healthier, to enhance your ability to relax and reduce stress. Um, and definitely not a lot to suggest that yoga is meant to tone your muscles and give you a yoga body. So all of these things that yoga is marketed as being able to help us with in our day and age. Hatha yoga in its original form was a lot more about transcendental goals, this commitment to the spiritual path, much less about health and the physical body. And this commitment to the spiritual path was often fiercely and brutally austere. So this this spirit, this thread of tapas was really, um, really there at the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of yoga. It definitely wasn't all about looking good. It definitely wasn't about getting a yoga body, losing weight, gaining muscle tone or getting healthier. Um, instead, Hatha Yoga was really characterized by this transcendental, this, this sacrificial attitude towards the body. Some of the practices that were designed to produce these dramatic transcendental kind of psychic experiences were clearly um, detrimental to health actually because improving health wasn't the goal it was about moving beyond the body which was seen as an obstacle to this higher holier place and um, you know even if the approaches used to do so were harmful to the body so hatha yoga is often translated um, in, by modern day yoga teachers in in classes as sun moon yoga you know there's this concept of balancing yin and yang masculine and feminine this idea of hatha meaning balance it's kind of this happy shiny notion and and that's that's cool but another translation um, if you look a little deeper and I learned this from Matthew Remsky who is an incredible um, scholar on the teachings of yoga, among many other things. But another translation of Hatha, he says, implies something closer to fierceness or the striking blow. And Matthew says that this is evident in the way several mudras and asanas are used to strike the perineum against the ground to rouse kundalini. And that's not something that I see many um, yogis and yoginis doing in your typical inner city yoga studio. Maybe some people would be interested in that, but it's definitely not something you come across every day. Extreme severe practices to transcend the body and seek experiences by extreme stimulation of the nervous system were kind of the norm um, in these older practices of hatha yoga these extreme kind of practices that really stimulated the stress response and I'll speak about the stress response a little bit more in a sec but basically it is when we um, overstimulate our, our bodies particularly our nervous systems to the point where our bodies go into an adrenalized survival state so when I think about um, old school yoga, I, I recall stories of yogis who buried themselves up to the neck in the ground and stayed there for weeks, all these things to demonstrate their austerity, their tapas or to build it. Um, I think of yogis who swallowed poison to display the purity of the body. Um, so they'd swallow poison but not die. Yogis who would hold their arms out for months or even years at a time until they couldn't put them down and their arms literally withered away. I, um, you may know about Kachari Mudra, which is this curling or rolling of the tongue back to insert into the lower sinuses um, so that other mudras and meditations can be practiced. But a more extreme version of Kachari Mudra um, practiced by some yogis 
is where they would slice the frenulum of their tongue with a razor blade so that it could be lengthened and um, more easily rolled back and inserted into the sinuses to close the nostrils from the inside. So pretty fucking extreme stuff, guys. And, you know, this practice is designed to achieve 100% focus. So as you can see, the body was was more an obstacle, was seen as an obstacle to something higher, um, just a container for the smaller self rather than something to be looked after and optimised. You know, ancient yogis wanted to get over this or at least that's what's suggested by some of the yoga literature. So modern yoga is really built upon a foundation that features these kinds of ancient practices as an intrinsic aspect of yoga, not as some obscure thing. Um, In yoga teacher trainings nowadays, we might look upon these old practices and go, "Hmm, yeah, uh, that's not really a thing nowadays, or, you know, that's, that's for really advanced people, really advanced practitioners even, and then kind of with a bit of side eye and then quickly shuffling on. But the fact is that this um, was yoga. Self-transcendence was and arguably still is yoga in its original form. Perhaps the nervous system response and the ecstatic highs that these ancient yogis were seeking could be partly explained by the stress response that I mentioned earlier. So this um, adrenalization of the body, this release of endorphins that happens when our bodies and when we are experiencing intense physical experiences. So it's think of the endorphin high you get from intense exercise. If you go for a really long, hard run or do some kind of full on vinyasa practice. Um, You know, I recall one particular vinyasa class. I did in a in a big very well known studio on the Gold Coast. It was actually on a full moon. I was teaching at this studio, and this practice was I wasn't teaching. I was a student. This practice was riddled with backbends and sweat inducing flows, like really hard practice. Um, after the class ended, I was amped. I felt like I had just (laughs) snorted a line of cocaine or something. Um, I ran to the beach um, under the full moon and I just, I was just flipping out. I was just running around like a mad woman. I was so wired. I couldn't sleep, but I felt so good. It was like a drug. I wanted more. Um, And I was definitely adrenalized. (laughs) I'd definitely been pushed by this really intense practice into um, an an adrenalized physical state. It was actually a stress response by my body and and your body will do this in uh, when it's asked to do extreme physical things as an adaptation to the perceived stress. Um, The adrenaline has many, many roles. Um, I'm and including, you know, giving you the energy to run away from this perceived dangerous activity or this perceived threat. Um, it can also happen when we are undernourished, when we haven't had enough food for the day or for more than a day and your body thinks that there is a famine or an environmentally induced shortage of food and it will give you, it will produce adrenaline and the idea of that is not to make you feel good (laughs) necessarily but to give you this surge of energy to go find some fucking food basically um so you know going back to this intense class that I did even though the studio um I did that practice at and and it was a studio where that kind of practice was, you know, the norm. It was really well known for these kinds of classes. And it was also a studio where people did injure themselves often. Um, I would have students come to me and tell me that they had not come to class for four or six or eight months because they had been injured. Um, but it was kind of this shameful thing. There was a lot of shame and secrecy around yoga injuries. And teachers were rarely, if ever, confronted if um, their students had injured themselves in class. Um, that's another conversation for another time. But basically the point I'm trying to get to is that 
this kind of thing, this extremism in yoga, this practice that doctors um, refer patients to for therapeutic reasons, this kind of extremism and intensity in physicality is not that far removed from the older extreme severe practices used to transcend the body. So that thread is very, very much alive in modern day yoga. In my classes, and I know in many other yoga teachers' classes, um, I encourage listening to the body, you know, kindness towards the body, body attunement. You know, we often find ourselves, as yoga teachers, we often find ourselves saying, listen to your body, body is boss, etc. And these ideals too are in the yoga literature. But then there's these other older ideals of surpassing the body, of seeing it as an illusion, as a an obstacle. And there's this ideal of effort of pushing yourself further and further, um, this self-transcendence that's in the yoga literature that, as I said, it just has not disappeared from yoga, not by a long shot. And these not very therapeutic attitudes of old Hatha yoga it seems like they've now been repackaged into a therapeutic lifestyle medicine that's meant to bring about better health, longevity and strength and so on. And you know what, this just works all too well. It's just so convenient is that it works seamlessly alongside our Western ideals of striving, of going harder um, for the typical you know, a type person that I see walking into an inner city power vinyasa lunchtime class, this repackaging of austere, disciplined, potentially injurious practices into something marketed as being good for good for you, it's just all too convenient, isn't it? It just becomes so easy to justify overly harsh practices as something health generating in the yoga world with that background of yoga literature and with our foreground of um, pushing forward, this surging forward kind of energy in our culture, this achievement orientated um, culture that we live in now. And this is where juice cleansing comes in. You know, the same sentiment, same logic that you get in the yogis who practice those extreme manifestations of Kachari Mudra, the slicing of the frenulum, slicing of the tongue, the same um, kind of spirit of that applies to a very rigorous vinyasa practice and it applies to a three or five or a seven day juice cleanse, namely um, of that a very strong Austere practice will stimulate a particular physiological response that could be interpreted as ecstatic. Whether that's cutting your tongue or a strong vinyasa class or the semi-starvation that is, um, you know, basically what a juice cleanse is. Let's be honest. So it's the same kind of shocked euphoria that you enter after an intense asana practice, um, th- this, this shocked euphoria that's reminiscent of the adrenalized state of the starving body, which is what we get with a juice cleanse. It's, it's all kind of in the same basket. Juice cleansing is essentially, <clears throat> it's essentially starvation. So I'll say that again. Juice cleansing is essentially starvation. It's at least semi-starvation. <laughs> you enter, when you do a, a, a juice cleanse, which is, you know, whether it's one, five, seven or more days subsisting off just vegetable juices or, you know, some cleanses even package a little bit of smoothie in there or um, even dal for, in air quotes, beginner cleanses. Um, but if you're still in a in a calorie deficit and particularly when you enter a severe and sudden calorie deficit like you would if you're doing a straight up juice cleanse with no other food, just juices. Um, For most people, this will switch on your fight or flight response. Your body thinks it's in danger. 
um, it will re- release adrenaline. You will feel a rush of energy. Um, that rush of, rush of energy is designed to make you seek out food as a matter of urgency. Basically, at least once the first few days of so-called detox symptoms have um, subsided, you become really hopped up on your stress hormones and many people report feeling great, (laughs) you know. So just touching on those detox symptoms, these things um, include, you know, headaches, low energy, just feeling pretty miserable, poor mood, bad breath, um, constipation, these kinds of things. And um, some people report that after a few days, these detox symptoms turn into a feeling of lightness and of bliss and that their headaches go away and um, they feel energized. So basically those detox symptoms in those first couple of days of you starving, they're just your body crying out for food. Let's just be really clear. These are not signs that your body is clearing toxins out. As I will explain shortly, they're probably more likely to be signs that your body is doing the opposite that it is um, reduced in its its capacity to detoxify um, that the phase one phase two detoxification um, in the liver is actually um, impeded by this kind of um, dietary regime and that the feelings of lightness and bliss and energy that you get thereafter is also not your body detoxifying. <laughs> this is an adrenalized stress response. It is hurtful to the body in the short term and in the long term. It is not health generating, but it has been repackaged and marketed as being so. So... Just finishing up on tapas and discipline. I, I I think this is a big part. This older spirit of extreme tapas and self-transcendence is a big part. It's still tightly woven through the fabric of modern day yoga. Except now, the austerity and physical manipulation of three to five days of starvation is being repackaged as healthy. So that's one part of why I think juice cleanses are so popular in um, modern day yoga circles. Um, Let me just mention one thing about that extreme tapas and and that's that it may come in other forms that are normalized in diet culture. So for example, um, practicing yoga to the point where we blunt our appetites and our eating becomes disordered or practicing yoga asana to the point where we no longer question our body dysmorphias. And as I mentioned before, Matthew Remsky writes really eloquently about this. Um, And he says that if Hatha yoga is a transcendental experience, the body is a vehicle for that type of experience. If Hatha yoga is a therapy, then it's a way of experiencing the wholeness of your embodied experience while you're doing anything. And that's a much broader, more sustainable model. And of course, these two run along a spectrum. And I think a really important question to ask is, when it concerns your yoga practice, where are you on that spectrum? Do you see your body as an obstacle that just needs to be overcome so that you can reach these higher transcendental places? Or is your yoga more of a therapy that allows you to attune to your body, not just on the yoga mat, but anywhere, (laughs) anywhere while you're driving, while you're um, um, interacting with your family, anywhere. So moving on from tapas, um, I'll just touch on a few other reasons why I think yoga uh, juice cleanses are so popular in yoga so another one um, also refers to another another niyama which is salcha which is loosely interpreted as cleanliness or even goodness and purity Um, so there's a very obvious link between a juice cleanse and cleanliness 
salcha. <laughs> but, um, you know, cle- salcha in the niyamas, it doesn't just mean physical cleanliness. So it, it could also mean um, recognizing habits that we've picked up in our life that no longer ser- serve us. And um, recognizing that if we take these these some of these habits onto the mat with us, that our practice gets a lot stickier. It can be a, a lot less smooth. Um, and that asks us to sift through these so-called impurities that we have brought with us to our practice. So it's not just about physical cleanliness and specifically not just about um, uh, cleansing. And that is in definite air quotes, cleansing the body. So there's salcha, this other niyama of purity. Purity, which seems to be... Um, a big aspiration for some yogis to cleanse themselves of this, you know, so-called negativity and dirtiness that a lot of people feel they come to yoga with. Many people come to yoga with a lot of wounds, um, with a lot of baggage, actually. And so I can see the appeal of this aspect of yoga, philosophy at least. Then we've also got the sister science of yoga, which is Ayurveda. And the sister science of Ayurveda, in my eyes, deals a lot more with the physical body itself. So whilst yoga is traditionally, um, at least Hatha yoga, traditionally a practice used to transcend the body, I see Ayurveda as a practice which um, was used to look after the physical body while we are still on this earthly plane. And as far as cleanses and fasts go, these are a part of traditional Ayurveda. So Ayurveda in the context of ancient India, um, where, for example, people were obviously of Indian descent. Um, so similar genetic pool, not like your typical inner city Western yoga studio where people um, people's genetic heritage is from all over the world. Also, the parasite load in India was much higher. Um, Lots and lots of other reasons which I've gone into in blogs about um, Ayurveda, TCM and intuitive eating on my website. But basically, Ayurveda as it was practiced by some of the ancient yogis where they were doing really full-on extreme cleanses and fasts was was, um, appropriate possibly for... The context that these ancient yogis lived in, they didn't have flushing toilets. Um, So perhaps the more extreme enemas and and stuff that they did was more beneficial. Um, Nowadays, maybe not so much. You know, they didn't have clean water perhaps and and doing a fast, you know, might have might have saved lives. It might have meant they did not ingest contaminated water at particular times of the year where fasts were carried out for religious reasons, maybe during dry times of the year when clean water was hard to get. Um, so, you know, there's that aspect of Ayurveda, and we'll talk about that more in upcoming podcasts, but this um, practice of cleanses and fasts, which is built into Ayurveda, probably has something to do with the popularity of yoga, uh, juice cleanses in yoga. Although I will note that in Ayurveda, no one practiced raw juice cleanses. Okay, <laughs> no one did that. Ayurveda, as well as Chinese medicine, um, very much vitalist modalities. So they... Um, they don't tend to emphasize raw food and specifically raw vegetable juices. They um, encourage uh, for, in, in general, you know, in just generally, they encourage um, consumption of warm foods for ease of digestion. So a raw vegetable juice cleanse is definitely not something an ancient yogi ever, ever did. So there's this aspect of kind of spiritual superiority as well, you know, thinking that if we have good tapas and salcha, lots of discipline and we're pure, that we relieve ourselves, however temporarily, of the frustration of being human by feeling closer to something superhuman, by temporarily shedding the limitations of being apart from things. And this is something we all experience as human beings. So, golly gosh, um, 
I think that's all I will say about why I think juice cleansers are so popular in yoga culture. You know, there's this, this huge intersection between diet culture and yoga culture. And, um, you know, we've got spiritual superiority interwoven in that. We've got ancient practices from Ayurveda, ancient cleanses and fasts from that. Um, and we've got people coming to yoga with baggage and body dysmorphia and disordered eating. And it all kind of rolls into a clusterfuck of this belief that juice cleansing is yogic. That it's discipline, that it's purity, that it is health, that it's spiritual advancement. And um, I really think that it's worth disentangling some of that stuff rather than taking it at surface level or, or believing um, the stuff that we read off the websites that say, um, yeah, our, our body, are you ready for a real life transformation to reset and rest your body? Um, just come and do our cleanse program or a fasting detox retreat. So I'm going to speak more now about the actual psychology and the behavior of restricting food And just to be really clear, juice cleanse is um, a period where food is obviously restricted. It is a form of disordered eating. I'm just going to just say that right now, okay? It's disordered eating. And while behaviors such as severely restricting calories, and that might, you know, be cutting out whole food groups or fasting or using food replacements like juice cleanses, um... While this stuff is is often normalized by the media and especially in mainstream yoga culture, they're actually really red flags, actually signs of disordered eating. So what is disordered eating? First, let's just address the distinction between disordered eating and eating disorders. So basically, guys, eating disorders occur on a spectrum. If you think of um, this spectrum at one end, we've got normal or even intuitive eating where someone eats when they're hungry generally but not necessarily always stops when they're full they listen to their body's cues they don't deprive their cravings they um they they don't restrict foods in order to alter their weight or the way their body appears okay it's it's kind of the way a little kid eats a little two or three year old you know they might eat what they feel like basically you can serve them a plate of food but they'll eat what they feel like and when they're done they'll leave the table and run around the table or um, play with their sibling like my little kids do they they eat and then they forget about it um so on the other end of the spectrum to that kind of normal or intuitive eating On the other end of the spectrum are our clinically diagnosable eating disorders and, you know, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa um, come to mind for most people and we'll talk about those more in future episodes. But in between these two, in between normal eating and eating disorders on this spectrum is what we refer to as disordered eating and it's a term used to describe unhealthy eating behaviours that are not necessarily in the diagnosable eating disorder category. So these can include things like obsession with weight and weight control, chronic dieting, caloric restriction, such as skipping meals or replacing meals with liquids. So for example, juices, (laughs) fears and anxieties around food, compensatory behaviors such as in air quotes, making up for a binge by restricting or purging or over-exercising. And by binge, this is obviously very subjective, um, depending on the person. Uh, It can include things like worries about body image, body image concern. Orthorexia, which is not yet a diagnosable eating disorder, but Um, hopefully on its way to being a recognized eating disorder. Orthorexia is an obsessive um, preoccupation with the cleanliness or the purity of food. Ring any bells, Soucher people? (laughs) Um, And the severity of orthorexia can range from disordered eating to pretty much um, full-blown eating disorder. 
And um, yeah, orthorex is something I'm all too familiar with. I spent years being very orthorexic about my food choices and um, being obsessed with exercise. Years that I lost, uh, basically, uh, where I lost health, where I lost friendships. Um, But I'll talk more about my personal story another time. For now, I just um, think it's important to recognise that while some of these issues I just mentioned may not seem as bad as clinical diag- clinically diagnosed eating disorders, they're still pretty bloody harmful. You know, they cause mental and emotional anguish and they have real physical consequences. I'll, I'll just mention for 10 seconds, um, while I was in the throes of orthorexia I lost my period for a year and guys that's never a good thing it's just not good it might be convenient but um, ladies you don't want to lose your period due to um, being malnourished it's it's not okay yeah and definitely impact upon, <laughs> impacted upon my relationships my poor boyfriend at the time hey Jay if you're out there <laughs> sorry about that dude that that was yeah I'm I would have been hard, harder <laughs> to live with during that time. Just, you know, going out for meals and being obsessive about what I've just eaten, not being able to eat ice cream with my friends. Like, fuck, I just lost so much joy and presence in my life. Um, so coming back to this spectrum of disordered eating and eating disorders, Disordered eating can easily turn into an eating disorder, guys. Um, it's it's one of the biggest, or it's actually considered the greatest predictor of developing an eating disorder. And remember, this disordered eating um, lies along that spectrum and it includes all that stuff I mentioned. It includes um, juice cleansing and the reasons people do it. And because this is such a great risk factor for developing an eating disorder, I just think, gosh, why? Why is this endorsed in yoga studios? Why is this repa- is this packaged with um, yoga passes and yoga challenges? It just, it just uh, fucking blows my mind. Anyway, I clearly can't make this episode um, <laughs> a child-friendly one. So I also just want to mention one last thing about disordered eating is that um, at least in my experience teaching yoga and um, practicing yoga for the last um, 13 years, being in the yoga world, maybe 15 years, um, I've seen a lot of people with either very, um, you know, with disordered eating or eating disorders practicing yoga and often practicing yoga in a very intense way multiple times a week or even multiple times a day um being an eating disorder dietitian um and and seeing some of um my clients go to attend classes not my classes or possibly my classes I just can't remember but just yeah seeing people with eating disorders attend classes and um yeah just see them absolutely smash themselves this is a thing that happens pretty commonly actually in yoga studios and when there's a lack of awareness this lack of screening for and a lack of consideration for eating disorders which by the way are increasing and thought to affect around nine ten percent of the population um uh if there's a lack of awareness of this stuff in yoga studios by yoga teachers um and there's this climate of um discipline and purity and juice cleansing we're asking for trouble we're just asking for trouble i think um eating disorders you know 10 percent of the population they have the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses guys they they are pretty dangerous and they affect people of all ages all genders all backgrounds all races all body sizes not just a skinny rich white girl disease so now i'm going to speak to what detoxification actually is because the reason so many people go on juice cleanses or juice fasts is that they claim that they wish to detoxify i think it's worth deconstructing that concept 
Detoxification is a topic that has a great deal of myth and incorrect information surrounding it. So I'm going to put my nutritionist hat on now and do my best to set the record straight. We're going to have a quick look at how detoxification works, the different organs that are involved and why most cleansers aren't actually helping with detoxification and what you can do on a daily basis to help with detoxification if that's something that interests you. So when we embark upon a juice cleanse, we, well, when I say we, I'm implying yogis. (laughs) Yogis generally want to clear out toxins. So just briefly, let's chat about what a toxin is. This is a term that gets thrown around a lot nowadays, but basically a toxin is a poisonous substance that's either made inside the body or is introduced into the body. If it's coming from outside the body, it's called exogenous, and if it's being made in the body, it's called endogenous. Exogenous toxins are things like the things that we voluntarily ingest, so alcohol, cigarette smoke, recreational drugs, um, over-the-counter medications, that kind of thing. And there's also your environmental toxins, so heavy metals, pesticides, biological inhalants, um, electromagnetic toxins, that kind of thing. Many of the toxins that our bodies are trying to detoxify, however, are endogenous toxins, things that are generated by normal processes in the body. So before we have a freak out that our bodies are making toxins, please know that this is actually very normal and that these endogenous toxins include digestive toxins from um, incompletely or improperly digested food, Um, And that can lead to the overgrowth of certain bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites. Other processes in in our bodies can also create what could be regarded as toxins. So for example, homocysteine and certain hormones can become toxic if levels get too high in our bodies. And then there are free radicals, which are of course a natural part of chemical reactions in the body. We want to minimise the damage these guys cause, but we can't completely avoid this. And keep in mind that there are other toxins that our bodies find tolerable or even helpful up to a certain amount. And these include certain vitamins, minerals and hormones. The dose makes the poison. These things become toxic only when levels climb too high. So that brings us to detoxification, this whole reason we claim to um, embark upon juice cleansers, or some of us. Detoxification is a metabolic process by which organs are changed into less toxic or more readily excretable substances. It involves the whole body. The liver, of course, plays a big role, but so do the lungs, the skin, the digestive, urinary and lymphatic systems. So once a toxin has become detoxified, usually by the liver, two things can happen. The toxin is changed into a form that is okay to hang around in the body or it becomes useful in the body and is reused. Or the detoxified substance needs to exit the body via pooing, peeing or sweating. So very briefly, I'm going to chat about the liver. The liver is our first port of of call for detoxification. When you digest food, those food particles are broken down and absorbed into your bloodstream and the first place that blood generally goes is the liver. It's a very hard working organ. Uh, It has many jobs outside of detoxification but for today we'll just talk about detoxification. There are three phases of detoxification and the first two of those happen in the liver. Phase one and phase two detoxification, funnily enough. Phase one is the first stage and that's where toxins are broken down and their form is changed. These broken down substances can actually be far more toxic, up to 60 times more toxic than the original substance after passing through phase one. So phase one detoxification must immediately be followed by phase two so that we don't have a lot of toxic intermediary stuff hanging around causing damage. 
for phase one detoxification to work properly. Now, this is a really important bit to note. Your body needs to be getting some important nutrients. And these include B vitamins, your vitamins A, C, D and E, glutathione, amino acids, which is what protein is broken down into, and a bunch of antioxidants and also minerals such as copper, zinc and magnesium. Phase 2 detoxification also occurs in the liver and it's known as conjugation. It requires a bunch of different enzymes for its various conjugation pathways. And what phase 2 does is it puts the toxic metabolites from phase 1 into a water-soluble form so that they can be excreted from the body. Each of those six different conjugation pathways break down different kinds of substances and all of them need certain nutrients to get these to work. And again, these nutrients include B vitamins, glutathione, uh, antioxidants such as flavonoids, a um, bunch of different minerals and amino acids. Now, the problem with juice cleansers is that, as you may have detected from those two phases of liver detoxification, amino acids or protein has a crucial role in detoxification of the liver. And although there are obviously many other nutrients involved in those phases of detox, I'm going to hone in on the amino acids and the glutathione that I mentioned. Now, glutathione is found in various foods and it's also made in the body in high amounts, a process that requires certain types of, again, amino acids, which come from protein. And this is why protein is so important as part of normal everyday detoxification. When people do a juice cleanse or even include um, smoothies, such as green smoothies in a cleanse, the focus is on the vitamins and minerals coming from them. But the problem with these kinds of cleanses or fasts is that there is no protein coming in. Okay, without protein, liver detoxification comes to a grinding stop. You really need to be providing the body with enough protein um, as part of your diet in general and particularly to keep your detoxification phases moving along. I'm pretty sceptical about how much detoxification is actually going on when people do a juice cleanse. The other reason people claim to be doing a juice cleanse is to take the burden off of the digestive system. The thing about this is, yes, when you do a juice cleanse, you do take the burden of the, di of the digestive system away because there's nowhere near as much bulk, if any, bulk or fibrous matter coming through. So your digestion will actually slow down. And this has many problems as well. Phase three detoxification I mentioned before is the elimination of um, waste matter from the body. But when there's no fiber coming into the body, it's very difficult to eliminate. Fiber is like the broom that sweeps the bowels out. And without fiber, detoxification slows down as well. Plus, when you eat less, when you take in fewer calories and just less food in general, digestion also tends to slow down. So with juice cleansers, you've got this double whammy of far less food, far less caloric intake and less fiber. As a side effect, people often will get constipated on a protocol like this or some people will actually have diarrhea which could actually indicate that there's constipation higher up the tract as the tissues around impacted slowed down feces become inflamed, they secrete water to try to move the impacted feces along and you get what looks like diarrhea but it actually could be constipation from not enough fibre and not enough food coming through. 
finally, the other big issue that I've been touching on a number of times through this podcast is that when we embark upon a juice cleanse, we are restricting food. We're restricting calories and we're restricting everything else pretty much. Protein, carbohydrate and fat. We're pretty much getting water, some vitamins and minerals and a um, small amount of sugar perhaps if you've retained juices from fruits in your cleanse. And anytime you restrict food, you are placing a stressor on the body. When you begin any form of diet, so you know, calorie restriction in the form of a juice cleanse would be considered a diet, there is an, an initial surge of the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol. Now these stress hormones elicit anti-inflammatory, immune suppressive, appetite suppressive and pain killing effects, which is why so many people report to feel better um, in at some point, usually after a couple of days of juice cleansing. Now this happens because your body sees the cleanse, which is a diet, as a perceived famine. And within a few days, you become hopped up on adrenaline and noradrenaline, which are the fight or flight hormones. You know, you feel more energized, more alert, and your appetite is suppressed. It's kind of like a truck driver who's jacked up on amphetamines and can drive for 20 hours straight without stopping to eat or sleep. Previously painful joints or old injuries are suddenly no longer troubling you. And people figure it's because they've completely cleanse their system or cut out whatever but this is because your body in its stressed starved state thinks you need to fight or flee so it sends out natural pain killing substances called endorphins to allow you to get away from this immediate threat or to prompt you to please find some food as quickly as possible the other thing i mentioned is cortisol now you could do some blood tests and see your inflammatory markers have reduced uh, a few days into a restrictive diet like a juice cleanse. And that's thanks to the increased cortisol pumping around your body. Some people even notice asthma or frequent colds clear up for the same reason. People may even see their cholesterol levels drop at the beginning of a restrictive diet. And this is because cortisol is made from the base molecule cholesterol and as your body kicks into stress mode it needs to turn more of its cholesterol into cortisol to keep you alive long enough to find some bloody food and then of course there's this weight loss so if you're taking in less calories um, if you have less fibrous bulk in your digestive system you're probably going to weigh a little bit less also in a state of semi-starvation, your glycogen stores are liberated and used up and the water that was accompanying that stored glycogen is released as urine. So you could lose a couple of kilograms, which is mostly water and very possibly some muscle, in just a few days. But actually this is another sign that your body has detected a food shortage and your primitive hormonal regulation system, the one that ca only cares about your survival and doesn't really give a shit about juice cleansing or any weight loss goals, that hormonal regulation system is using any and all available sugars and fuels to hunt or go searching for some food. So subsequently, blood levels of sugars and lipids go down quickly especially once glycogen stores are all used up and are not being properly replenished. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what detoxification is and what's actually happening when you do a juice cleanse. As you can see, doing a juice cleanse actually impedes detoxification. You're not getting your protein, you're not getting your fiber, digestion slowing down. You're not able to detoxify um, and move toxins out of your body in, uh, anywhere near as efficiently as when you're eating a normal, healthy, adequate, balanced diet. And this explains many of the detox symptoms, which I'm saying in air quotes, that people claim to have. You know, the headaches, the bad breath, the constipation. These are not signs your body is cleansing. They are signs your body <laughs> is crying out for food. So we might feel an urge to detoxify. We live in a world where there are toxins around us and it's pretty unavoidable. If we do want to help our bodies to detoxify, there are ways to do it. 
without crazy juice cleansers that hurt our bodies. All we need to do is use a little common sense. So I'm going to give you a couple of my um, top suggestions to help support your natural detoxification pathways and keep you feeling well. So the first one is to support your liver. Now, as we've mentioned, the liver is the main engine of your body's internal detoxification system. You can support your liver by being in bed by 10.30 p.m. at the latest, as your liver's detoxification pathways are mostly active overnight. You can also use food and herbs to provide the essential ingredients needed to create the molecules that protect and repair your body. And of course, make sure that you're getting enough protein. So the herbs include things like St. Mary's thistle, dandelion, burdock root, artichoke and turmeric. These are all great for liver function, as are foods like garlic, avocado, walnuts and green vegetables. Another way that we could support detox- detoxification is to drink plenty of water, not heaps of water, <laughs> but drink enough water and eat plenty of water containing foods. And this intake of water will support your kidneys and bowels which are the other important organs of detoxification. Making sure that you've got enough water coming in helps your bowels to stay regular. Another way that we can improve our body's capacity to detoxify is just through enjoying some regular exercise that makes you feel good. The exercise heats you up, it makes you sweat, it opens your pores, which helps you release toxins through your skin and your breath. And then, of course, there's all the benefits of exercise besides detoxification. Reducing our intake of alcohol and coffee. I know it's really boring. People don't want to hear that, but it's got to be said. These two put extra strain on your liver and do tend to increase inflammation in the body. So if you really want to do a detox, don't cut out food. (laughs) Reduce your alcohol and coffee intake and see how you feel after a couple of weeks. Of course, this needs to be done gently, especially if you're dependent on coffee as a source of um, energy for your body. You want to go gently with this one. So there are a couple of things that you can do to support your liver specifically, but just in general... There are plenty of things you can do to eat to support your detoxification phases in your liver and they're all pretty much just common sense. You know, eating good quality food as much as possible, organic if possible, but you know, not all of us are privileged enough to be able to access that kind of food. So don't stress about it if you can't eat organic food 100% of the time, okay? Just do your best. Drink clean, filtered water if you live in an area where water um, safety especially is threatened. Eat, if you can, eat only low mercury fish. Have a diet that's got plenty of plants, that's rich in fibre for those healthy bowel movements. And perhaps liver friendly foods like leafy green veggies, um, especially your broccoli and your brassicaceae. Um, Good quality protein. Of course, your healthy oils, olive oil, coconut oil, butter, seeds, nuts, healthy carbohydrates from root vegetables or whole grains, fruit, all of those things. Pretty basic, pretty general stuff. There are some supplements you can take for liver detoxification support and herbs as I've already mentioned but this podcast is getting really long so if you do want to know more about those there's plenty of information online about that. I'm just going to touch one la- on one last thing and that is about water fast which are basically an even more extreme version of a juice cleanse. Basically you don't take any calories in, you only take water in. I have done short water fasts lasting a day in my very disordered um, orthorexic times in my life. I have done uh, short water fasts and I can tell you it is not pleasant to be starving (laughs) at all. Uh, I once had a partner who whilst doing a yoga teacher training, he was convinced by his yoga teachers to 
take on a one week water fast. So one week with absolutely no food, drinking water only. And watching him go through that was absolutely heartbreaking. He was already a pretty lean guy going into this and coming out of it, he had absolutely lost weight that he couldn't really afford to lose. I remember watching him break his fast with a mango and he was crying like a baby at this point. Everyone, this is disordered eating at its finest. This is um, disordered eating that's been rebranded and relabeled by yoga culture as health generating and it was not a pretty thing to watch. Anyway, in conclusion, most of us have somewhat troubled, ambivalent, kind of inconsistent relationships to our bodies as it is. And in people who have a tendency to discipline and to punish, yoga and yoga culture can actually potentiate a worsening of this relationship. The discipline of an austere and intense yoga practice allows some practitioners to feel some relief and maybe a sense of gaining some foothold amidst the groundlessness of being human. A juice cleanse could also fill this void, you know, take us closer to feeling more than human. It gives us relief from what Pema Chodron calls the fundamental ambiguity of being human. It gives us a stress-induced high repackaged as health benefit that leads us to believe we also have the discipline and purity, the tapas and salcha, that are so prized both in our Western culture as well as in some yoga schools of thought. For yogis, juice cleansers hit multiple birds with one stone. But this effort to generate health, austerity and purity is extremely misguided, as well as physiologically invalid. In an attempt to improve the body, or even to transcend it, we actually hurt it. And in the process, we increase our risk of developing or amplifying disordered eating and body dysmorphia. So that's all for today. I hope that you got something useful out of this, and I will be cracking on with recording more episodes about the intersection between yoga and diet culture. Take care of yourselves and see you next time. Thank you for being here and for straddling the tricky edges of yoga land and diet culture with me. I hope this podcast encourages you to compassionately and continuously question the ways that contemporary yoga is unfolding and interacting with other big forces in the world to develop a discerning mind and open heart and to skillfully dodge the diet BS that often comes along with studio culture. Like you, I'm eager to keep learning and sharing and I put all relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, online nutrition counselling services and lots more at funkyforest.com.au. While you're there, make sure to download my free ebook, A Modern Yogi's BS Free Guide to Wellbeing. It's a light-hearted, easy read with my top six tips on dodging diet culture crap in the yoga world, whilst creating sustainable and balanced health from the inside out. If you love the podcast, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash non yogi. There are some pretty rad rewards there such as exclusive content, discount codes, giveaways and the ability to chat with me. As more episodes roll out, I'll be adding even more fun bonuses such as my non-diet yogi cookbook and mini courses. You can access most of the goodies at the lowest level which is just $2 US a month or around $2.90 Australian dollars. Like most mummers, I'm ridiculously busy parenting, working, studying and all the rest. I've recorded a bunch of episodes and some of these have required five separate takes just to get a whole episode done as I need to wake up before my little ones to do it and they get up very early. So I'm crossing my fingers that the Patreon will give me the financial capacity to keep doing this. 
Another way to support is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be so awesome. Thank you. The in and outro song is Evening Glow by John Anderson. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time.